And next we have, is it uh, Dr. Uh, Joe McGuire? Thank you. Joe McGuire is not a doctor. I've just been explaining that here. Let me just pull up my uh, presentation for you real quick. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for hosting this evening. It means so much to me. Well, um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, the implications of legal marijuana to the workplace. Um, while I, I do a lot of traveling and speaking on the um, outcomes in Colorado, I've lived there for um, over 30 years now. I actually grew up just outside of Chicago in Calumet City. So this uh, used to be my home in Colorado was my second home, but I think I've been in Colorado long enough that this is now my second home. But um, when Colorado legalized marijuana, um, at that time, I, I had been for 10 years working in the field of prevention um, and intervention for adolescents with uh, risk behaviors, youth, youth risk behaviors. I had just changed jobs because of a lack of grant funding um, to work with a small drug testing company. Our primary uh, responsibilities were to oversee people in mandatory federal drug testing programs for the U.S. Department of Transportation. So how many of you want to get in an airplane with a stoned pilot? Right, okay. That was my job, to make sure the pilots got their drug tests, railroad engineers, over-the-road truck drivers, school bus drivers, right? So that was primarily what I was doing at the time. I was still involved in community drug prevention for youth. Um, it was just something very close to my heart for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, and I'll, I'll mention this to you briefly in a moment, but I am the mother of an addict. Um, did not intend to become the mother of an addict, as many of you can relate. Um, but because of that, I wanted to stay really intensely involved in prevention in my community. Um, so Colorado legalized marijuana, and immediately in our drug testing clinic, we not only saw our drug test numbers double, triple, quadruple, we saw 10 times the amount of drug testing in the court system, in the workplace, post-accident testing because it was an occupational health clinic. But the most shocking and concerning was the numbers of youth, kids that were coming in. And while that in and of itself was deeply concerning, um, prior to 2012, kids would come in and have a drug test, a lab-based drug test, and they might have um, 50 nanograms of THC in their urinalysis, maybe if, if they were really a heavy user, really being impacted by this drug, they might have 100 or 200. And if we saw a couple hundred nanograms, we were sitting down with the parents. We were bringing them in, we were having a consult with the doctor to say we have a real problem here, there needs to be an intervention. Dr. Randall's probably snickering at the innocence of a couple hundred nanograms because within 90 days post Amendment 64, our kids were coming in with 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 nanograms. Within the year, 10,000 nanograms. I could not even comprehend how much pot they have to use to get that amount in their system. But then I didn't know about concentrates at the time, right? Um, I just want to give a little bit about the impact in the workplace because civilly in your community, this is going to have a bearing on you overall. Um, first of all, I want to say a lot of what you see, in fact, most all of what you see in the media about the inefficiencies, um, the inefficacy, the failure of workplace drug testing is absolute and complete untruth based in fabrications, based in urban myth, based in what those who are profiting from selling marijuana um, put out there because workplace drug testing is a threat um, to their way of life. So uh, National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws is very much on the attack for workplace drug testing and actually hoping to eliminate that um, nationwide. So because of that, that is really driving my passion to defend safe and drug-free workplaces. Why? Well, marijuana, cannabis in, in general, remains Schedule One at the federal level for very good reason. It is 
addictive. There is high potential for addiction, and the higher the THC potencies go, the greater the rates of addiction. Um, we don't have any standard accepted medical use. We do not have any healative properties at this point uh, for medical marijuana. So we don't have any, when you, when you look at this slide and it says no accepted standards for medical use, this means we have no prescribable amounts. A physician cannot prescribe like a dose um, similar to a, another type of medication and say, if you take this particular dose, this is your outcome, this is the contraindicator from other medications that you're taking, et cetera. And um, because we don't have any dosing standards because the substance is very unstable, it has a different impact on different people who use it for a wide variety of reasons, we have not to this day been able to standardize it. My personal opinion is we're actually getting further away from those standards um, to descheduling because of the high potencies. We, you know, we might be able to get a handle on a 1%, a 3%, a 5%, or even a 10%. In Amsterdam, THC over 15% is illegal. We didn't do that. We said unlimited, okay? So why is this important for the workplace? Because employers need to really understand that schedule one means not prescribed, means not HIPAA compliant, means when your employee walks in and says, well, I have this medical marijuana card and there's nothing you can do about it, that card just is an admission that I use pot. It, it, there's no HIPAA protections at this point in time. So because it meets this criteria, and by the way, I just wanna be very clear. President Barack Obama um, had an investigation done of cannabis early in his first presidency to determine whether or not cannabis could be removed from scheduling or descheduled. In a six-year investigation, they finally released a, port, a report in 2016 um, with six governmental agencies that said, we have tried to look at this from every angle that we can, but every ounce of science met the full criteria for Schedule One. So we cannot remove it from scheduling. So that was just reiterated in 2016, okay? So I just wanna cover a couple of myths about drug testing before I get to what's happening in Colorado because this is very confusing for people. Um, first of all, we hear it's safe, it's harmless, it's like a glass of wine, no big deal. Um, there, there are a lot of reasons that that's just a really silly argument. First of all, you can drink a glass of wine and not get drunk. You can't smoke a joint and not get high. I can have a glass of wine. Um, my 16-year-old daughter sitting next to me is not getting a contact drunk, um, but if I, or buzz, whatever. Um, but if I'm smoking a joint and she's next to me, she's getting a contact high. There's just a lot of differences. They don't behave the same, they don't act the same. Um, this notion that it's safer than alcohol. Please understand that this statement only comes from purely a lack of data. There is no scientific evidence or data that says marijuana is safer than alcohol. What we have is the fact that the World Health Organization has been tracking accidents and injuries and um, illnesses and deaths related to alcohol for almost 100 years, but have never tracked the, these um, data sets for marijuana. So therefore, the marijuana industry says, well, look, it's safer than alcohol because we don't have any of this bad stuff happening. The real, reality of it is we haven't tracked um, the data. So it is out there, it does happen, but we just don't have it written on paper. Does not make it safer. Um, we are actually hearing young people in particular say, well, marijuana is not an impairing substance. It absolutely is an impairing substance. If it's not an impairing substance, then why are you bothering to use it, right? What's the appeal if it doesn't alter your mind? Um, we hear that if I use marijuana one time, it will show up on my drug test 30 days later. That's not fair so you shouldn't be able to test me for it at work. The reality of that is that anybody who uses marijuana one time, only one time, when we're gonna be really honest about this, not lie, one time, and then gets a drug test 30 days later, there's no trace of THC in their system. It's impossible. THC, just one dose, it goes in and out of the body three to five days, um, if it's a measurable amount, depending on how much they used and what they used. Um, this, this myth comes from uh, people who are chronic users over time and then decide to cease use. I had a guy in Alaska 
and a drug testing company that I work with. He'd been trying to get a job as a miner. Miners um, start in Alaska at six figures. He'd been trying to get this job in mining for years. They finally called. Well, now he has a problem because he's been smoking pot. So he calls me up at the drug testing company and he said, I want to come in and I want to see how long it takes the marijuana to get out of my system so that I know when to time the drug test for them and I can like drag my feet a little bit and delay it so that I can get the job, right? So that's the guy that 30 days later still had a positive and now with the new high potencies and now with multiple daily use instead of weekly use or occasional use, not 60 days later, not 90 days later, but 120 days later was when we got him a clean drug test. So that's where the 30 days later thing comes from. Uh, presence and system testing isn't fair for that reason is what people say, but that's the only thing that we have. Every drug test, even alcohol testing right now is presence and system testing, and it's what we've got. Um, I, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these because I wanna get to the meat of it. What's happening in Colorado? Right now, we have um, a lot of fear-based reactionary decisions by employers to withdraw drug testing from the workplace, to stop doing any type of enforcement of drug and alcohol policies, uh, to remove THC or marijuana from the drug panel entirely. We're seeing these numbers grow by employers who say it's overwhelming, it's threatening, it's scary, I feel like I'm gonna get sued, I'm confused, I don't really know what to do. So you'll see here that of um, some businesses surveyed, about 10% in Denver and Boulder, um, considered um, one single region in Colorado, dropped marijuana from their pre-employment test, 2% removed um, the drug from all drug testing, 9% um, of the companies in Pueblo responded that they omitted marijuana from pre-employment screening. This is more and more common. We're actually seeing large, large corporations, um, like retail corporations that just no longer do any type of marijuana testing unless there's an accident um, and injury involved and then they'll do a post-accident. So what's the big deal about that? We have this data and, and this data has been around for a good 15, 20 years. It's nothing new. Um, substance abusers are five times more likely to file a worker's compensation claim. We actually have a lot of insurance information based on that. Uh, roughly 35% of industrial injuries take place um, in the U.S. that involve employee drug or alcohol use. That's over a third. Uh, substance abusers are 33% less productive on the job. This is a multitudinal, longitudinal study um, in actually several countries where we've seen this data. Of course, um, absenteeism is significantly higher, uh, higher number of medical claims. Uh, of course, operating machinery um, is high risk. Substance abusers are responsible for 40% of workplace fatalities, 40%. Imagine the lives that could be saved if we could turn us back into a drug prevention culture rather than a drug friendly culture. And then substance abuse costs a small business owner approximately $7,000 a month in lost revenue. Um, normally when I'm doing my longer presentation, I'll spend a lot of time on this um, explaining how those dollars are lost. We're doing kind of a short presentation this evening, um, but if you'd like more information on that, please let me know. When it comes to employee marijuana use specifically, okay, 55% more industrial accidents, 85% more injuries, 75% more absenteeism. There are pages and pages of data that go along with this study, um, but I don't want to just stand here and read you stats all night. That would be super boring. Um, but we know that there is significant impact to the workplace. Right now in the U.S., over three quarters of employees in the U.S., over 75% live in states where marijuana is legal in some form. So this is incredibly important. And what I hear from employers is, so what? What if my employee uses pot on Friday night, on their own time, after work? I don't care as long as they come to work sober Monday morning, right? Well, it's a whole new day in that argument because with the higher potencies, we have longer lasting highs. Um, we do have people who have blogged, who have reported. Um, there's, there's several... Um, blogging tools out there, a lot of them through Reddit and, and other areas where people track their highs, track, uh, track and log their experiences. Um, we see users who say, you know, I went to Colorado, I used this product, I didn't feel right for two days, three days, whatever. 
Um, but it's not only that. That's probably more of the exception. What I'm really concerned about is this isn't Friday night anymore. Our folks don't just use on Friday night. Friday night turns into Saturday night, turns into Sunday night. Now we don't just have daily use, we have multiple times a day use. With legalization comes more frequent, more chronic use, and those who are already engaging in use really up their game. So let me just give you one example of what this impact could look like, all right? This is an old study. Um, it, it's uh, now well over 10 years old, actually probably closer to 20 years old now. Um, there was a pilot study done in uh, New Zealand and uh, so what they did is they had these pilots become proficient on a particular flight simulator. And then once they were all proficient and, and could achieve expert level on a flight simulator, they had them smoke a marijuana cigarette. And I think at that time it was like a five milligram cigarette. Nowhere near any potency that we have today. Once they smoked the marijuana cigarette, they got back in the flight simulator in time increments, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, crashed the simulator, crashed the plane, crashed the plane, two hours, four hours, crashed the plane. After a certain time, they took a break. Everybody went back to the dorms for the night. The next morning, they came in 24 hours later. Here were the results of the group of pilots that said, I'm no longer impaired by the, the, by the joint I smoked yesterday. Okay, difficulty in aligning with and landing on the runway, increased vertical and lateral deviation from the required flight path, lateral deviation on approach was um, twice the pre-marijuana test, significant increase in distance from the center of the runway on touchdown, one pilot landed off the runway entirely. This is 24 hours later after an old school joint, back in the old days. What would that look like with today's marijuana? And to the employer who says, Friday night use isn't a big deal, none of my concern. Um, I, I really want them to understand the key here, the key phrase in all of this is that very last bullet point. These pilots reported they were not aware of any impairment. That is very common. We hear folks say I use it all the time, doesn't do anything to me, I don't have any impairment ever. Um, there is, a, I'll let the doctors can explain this better than I can, but um, cannabis tends to shut off the part of the brain that tells you you've had enough, you're not functioning properly, right? Um, so that's something that we see. Now, let's talk about challenges for employers. Um, since we have these high potencies, and Karen showed you some pictures, here's a few of mine. Um, new delivery systems, waxing, vaping, um, edible products definitely complicate the workplace. This is what employers call me about the most. So you've all seen the e-cigarette. You've seen people who use the e-cigarette to try to curb their tobacco addiction or nicotine addiction. Um, on the left here, on the bottom, these are THC or marijuana cartridges that go into a vape pen. Initially, when these first came out, the pen was very distinctive. You could tell the difference between a tobacco vape and a, a marijuana vape. That is no longer the case. Now they look very standard. And just to give you an example, um, here are two different products. One of these is specifically made for tobacco, and one of these is specifically made for cannabis and marketed for that purpose. Can you tell which is which? These are the cartridges that you drop in. One of these is a set of nicotine cartridges. The other one is a set of THC cartridges. Can you tell which is which? Now, these are the flavor drops. So you don't just smoke it straight, you put flavor drops in it so it smells like grape or cotton candy or strawberry or vanilla or what have you. This masks the smell so you no longer get the distinct skunky sweet odor um, that you typically get. So now you're gonna smell something a little fruity, right? Um, if you're sitting very close to the front, you can see that the ones on the left um, are, are labeled like Yellow Brick Road and Dark Side of the Moon. I don't know what flavor that is, but you know, on the right you see the marshmallow and strawberry. So the right is the tobacco product and the left is the cannabis product. But where we have the challenge is that employers cannot tell the difference. All they know is their employees are coming in and something's wrong. How I discovered these products in 2013 was the uh, director of our local nursing school called me and said, I need your help. My students are coming in from break and there is something wrong. I think they're high, it doesn't make any sense. They're just using their vape pens. 
And I didn't know anything about vape pens. Um, I was in drug testing. That didn't mean anything to me. So I called a friend who worked at the uh, American Lung Society up in Denver, and I said, have you ever heard of this? Do you know what she's talking about? And he's the one who sent me the picture of the THC cartridges and said, this is what you're dealing with. So many campuses, employment campuses, college campuses, high school and middle school are banning e-cigarettes um, because of the marijuana issue. By the way, the number one consumer market for vape pens in the state of Colorado is middle schoolers, age, uh, grades six to eight. Um, Quest Diagnostics Drug Test Index is tracking increased dr uh, positive drug test results since legalization. So they say that um, uh, we have the greatest increase in use of all illicit drugs by use employees in the last 12 years based on laboratory results. So those positives were going down, 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 down. And then since legalization, they have now skyrocketed up. I'll show you the impact in Colorado in just a moment. According, this one, this one I want you to really hear me say. According to the Euro, US Bureau of Labor Statistics, drug and alcohol related deaths in the workplace soared in 2016 with a spike of more than 30% in a single year. That's heartbreaking. They also show that fatal work injuries in 2016 were the highest since 2008. We're going in the wrong direction. This is what happened the first year after legalization of recreational marijuana in Colorado. We were at the national average, like everybody else, of 6% positive drug tests in our state. In the first year, the very first year, 2013, we went from the national average of 6%, we jumped to 20%, and Washington jumped to 23%. Now, why does that matter? Because we have a very strong employer rights statement in Colorado that says zero tolerance in the workplace, employers can enforce their policies, this is not allowed. But by this graph, what did the employees hear? Woohoo! Right? Employees said, it is now, in Colorado, my constitutional right to use marijuana. And so this is why employers feel pressured, because the message doesn't get out that this isn't OK to go to work high. The message is, this is your right. Employer, beware. Um, and so we have, of course, huge safety issues. Of 600 employees surveyed, 48% in the state of Colorado said they've gone to work high in the past 30 days. This was this past year, 2018, and this survey was done by Westward. Westward is a pro-marijuana journal, um, online journal and newspaper. And so this is their survey. This isn't me telling you something that I made up. This is what they say, 48%. I've gone to work high in the last 30 days. Here I have my friend Chuck. He's in mobile drug testing. He's a retired cop. One of his clients was an electric company. Can we say safety sensitive, right? So they're doing pre-employment hiring and they call Chuck out to do pre-employment drug test. He shows up with his mobile kit. As soon as they see him walk in, nine of the 12 applicants get up and walk out. Of the three that took the test, two were clean, one tested positive for THC. Let me tell you something, those aren't good hiring odds. Last week, the, uh, this actually just this past week, Denver Post had a big article that says construction season is coming and Association of General Contractors is worried because we cannot fill the jobs. Lowest unemployment rate ever and we cannot find qualified workers to do the work in the midst of uh, home building. One of the things I want you to know about this story with Chuck, um, you know, you'll see that the date of this is 2015. So you might wanna say, hey Joe, you know, why don't you get a newer story? Well, there is a newer twist on this story. Um, Christmas 2017, uh, this company, after, after having several of these incidents right here, they decided to just chuck the drug testing program, we're done. Unless it's post-accident, it's very serious, we're not gonna waste our time anymore. They call Chuck and they say, we got a guy in the emergency room, he started an arc flash fire, he's burned over 90% of his body, we need you to go in and do a post-accident drug test. Chuck walks into the emergency room with his drug testing kit, and this gentleman from his hospital bed cheats the drug test with fake urine. He was ready. 
So uh, said, you know, we're going to have to do an oral fluid test, and then he refused. So called the company. The man's refusing. So he goes home. 24 hours later, they call him back. He actually is there on Christmas Eve. He's going to do the drug test. Chuck does the oral fluid test. Of course, the only thing present in his system is THC. And the company says, we really need to reevaluate our policies because by not doing our random drug testing policy, we've given the impression that this is acceptable. One of the largest contractors in the state of Colorado um, is GE Johnson. They say if we have to complete a federal job like roads and bridges where we receive federal money, we have to hire people from outside the state to complete the work because we can't find workers in the state who will pass a drug test. Uh, in southern Colorado, where Dr. Randall is from, paid construction says for every 75 people we interview, we can find about 15 who can pass the drug test. Now, when I said that a small business owner loses $7,000 per month in lost revenue, if any of you are in the workforce today or have been at any point and you know the time, effort, energy, and expense it takes to hire one new employee, Here's a huge amount of dollar drainage on a small business owner. Canyon City Workforce Center said it took two months to find three commercial driver's license drivers that could pass the drug test. What is wrong with that picture right there? Those guys are under DOT drug testing rules. They know better. These are people in safety sensitive positions where there is zero tolerance federally. I have a friend who owns a staffing company in Colorado Springs. She says more than half the applicants who come to us looking for a job, um, they can't place them because they fail the drug test and one in three attempt to cheat the test. The drug test cheating industry is growing in our state. It's actually a, quite a booming cottage industry. And so these kits are sold where you can purchase fake urine and um, you just take that little bottle, it's got a little hand warmer. You do have to get it um, initially warm so that you can just keep the temperature up to snuff. So as uh, just your friend, I'm here to tell you that the majority of fake urine and real urine gets heated up in convenience store microwaves. So I just want you to know that. So watch out for those hot dogs. Um, challenges that employers are calling me and asking me, what, what do I do about this? People who own HVAC companies, plumbing repair, electricians, are going into homegrown home grow operations and their employees are coming out sick. They have to go to the emergency room. They're losing one to two employees for the entire day because they're in the ER um, due to chemical exposure. Um, and exposure to all the chemicals, the butane, the propane that are used to make the, um, the, the uh, concentrates. Here we have a, an employee that was injured when a hash oil lab exploded, very similar to a meth lab while they were on the job. One in five marijuana users in the state also report driving after using marijuana. How many employers have drivers driving company vehicles? I had a very large employer, a national employer based in Houston, Texas, who called me and said, hey, Joe, since it's legal in Colorado, we're thinking about allowing our employees to keep some THC in their system. We're going to drop the zero tolerance. It's not fair. So they need to have some in their system. And I said, well, how much do you think is allowable? He said, well, you know, the cutoff level is 15 nanograms now. So we were thinking 100 would be fair. I said, OK. So what does 100 nanograms mean? Well, I don't know. I think that you know that's why I called you. I said, oh, OK, well, I conduct the drug test. Um, I'm not a toxicologist. I'm, I don't work at the lab. So I don't know what 100 nanograms means. In fact, most toxicologists don't really know what it means because those standards are set by SAMHSA, Substance and Mental Health Services Administration, at the federal government level. And it took 25 years to come up with those standards based on uh, Department of Transportation testing. So uh, you're just going to go with 100? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, don't you think that sounds good if we say, you know, you can have 100? And I said, okay, well, here's what I think. I think when one of your drivers has an accident and someone on the road or your employee is hurt, maimed, or killed, and they're sitting in the courtroom prosecuting, and they say to this employee, what gave you the right to drive with marijuana in your system? And he looks at his employer and says, well, he said I could have 100 nanograms in my system, and that was OK. All eyes are going to turn to you. And you're going to have to explain why that was OK. And he said, I'll call you right back. <laughs> and he never did. 
The good news is I will say that boundaries do work. Workplace drug and alcohol policies are successful. Sword figure construction in Pueblo, Colorado says we didn't change our policies. We communicated, we enforced our policies. Our employees know if you wanna work here and you wanna make the good wages that we pay, you don't come to work stoned, you pass the drug test and we do a good job. Same with Pueblo Utilities Company. They say we had to do some soul searching, we had to get tough about our policies, we had to actually start enforcing them. Um, but because we did, we haven't had the same problems. I also want you to know that in the 30 years of mandatory drug testing by U.S. Department of Transportation for, in, for your airline pilots and your school bus drivers, we find in that 30-year program that employees in a mandatory drug testing program have 50% less drug use than those who are not. We know this works, we know it's a deterrent, we know it promotes safety. Um, we also know this through um, military branch testing, Coast Guard testing, et cetera. Um, what I wanna mention very briefly because I don't know that it's going to be said with any of our other speakers who I'm very anxious to hear. We do not currently have any type of impairment testing for marijuana for roadside. So when you wanna talk about people out on your roadways that are stoned, and let me tell you, Dr. Randall and I were frightened enough coming over here without legal weed. <laughs> we had people cut us off in ways I did not know existed. And you're gonna add some pot to that? Our fatal car crashes in Colorado are, are at such a concerning level that the director of Colorado State Patrol came out two weeks ago and said this is an epidemic, it is a crisis, and it must stop. We have no tools and we're not close to solving this issue. It will take years for us not only to have enough measurable oral fluid to do a quick saliva test, but also to have a standard for impairment. Um, so we're light years away and we're making these decisions way before we're ready. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of this. One of the things employers will say to me, I'm gonna be fine as long as I don't hire stoners. Well, there's a perception of what that looks like. Not everybody who uses marijuana is your quote hippie. Um, many of them are business executives in suit and ties. So you cannot have stereotypes around this issue. You really have to look at it as a whole. And you have to say, and this comes straight from the cannabis industry. This is their recommendation to me on this topic. We are in a date and time where you have to ask yourself, who is allowed to be under the influence of work? Who can have slow response time? Who can have memory retention problems? Who can have trouble with multi-divided attention tasks? That is their recommendation. Um, I also just very quickly want you to understand there is an entire subculture of people who know which jobs have drug testing and which do not. Um, they blog about it, they post about it, you can search, there's huge search engines about it, and if you don't drug test, they consider you to be drug friendly. I have a whole bunch of stories that go behind that, but I won't take up time right now. The marijuana industry says if you wanna keep a drug-free workplace, you must defend why each and every position under your employee should not be under the influence at work. So we're coming to that age where it's not an employer's right to safe and drug-free workplace, but it's an employee's right to use drugs. And we have to make the argument against that. And by the way, we do have a federal act called Safe and Drug-Free Workplace Act. It is not enforced, it is under attack. And that act was written to protect the vulnerable employee from his coworker who uses drugs and causes him accident and injury. It is not just the employer's right to safe and drug-free workplace, but is their responsibility to protect the vulnerable worker. So uh, at the end of the day, I want you to understand that this isn't just about busting people who use drugs. It's not uh, about being pro or anti or whatever. What this is about is safety. Every employee has a family, and we want them to come home at the end of the day, fingers and toes intact, limbs, arms, with the ability to love their children and their family and provide for them tomorrow. We are eroding that opportunity for American citizens. And the only thing I wanna leave you with is that as the mom of an addict who is committed to marijuana as his sole drug of choice, my child who's been in and out of treatment for nearly 10 years now, who will not listen to his mother, who will not listen to his baby sister, who doesn't care what dad or grandma or big brother has to say, when his employer said to him, Jordan, I need you to pass the drug screen, 
because you're one of the best employees I have and I don't want to lose you, guess who got clean? So could I, thank you, could I implore every employer as a mom to say, please do this for my kid? Thank you.